In this video, I'm going to talk about composition. What that means in the context of photography is how we construct the elements within the frame of the photograph in order to draw the viewer's eye and attention to what you want to show them. There are a lot of construction tools that you can draw on, and the more one uses them, the more they become unconscious, and that's mainly where you want to keep them. As humans, and actually as all species, our eyes are scanning constantly to recognize patterns, shapes, and lines. Our visual development has been closely linked to human evolution, the need to find food, as well as our need to survive against predators. A snake will become a lion that is unharmonious within a surrounding of, say, a sand dune. Patterns and repetition can allow us to feel secure within a scene while interruptions can cause excitement or distress. As modern humans, we've internalized composition conventions without really thinking about them. Though as photographers, we need to know how to create balance within a scene. Once we've achieved balance, we get a feeling that the image has worked. The next question to ask is, what does work mean? To someone starting out in photography, composition may seem mysterious or that there are secrets held by a select few. But in essence, it's the ability to recognize that there are ways of arranging the elements within the frame that enhance one's ability to communicate with the viewer. There's no such thing as a correct composition. It's more about building up a toolbox of ideas that you can draw on in any given situation. So in order to talk about composition, one needs to discover why some images work or spark the viewer's attention. I think the best way to discuss this subject is to look at photographs and try to dissect the compositional qualities that contribute to the strength of the image. Over time, a number of so-called rules have developed in art theory and more recently in photographic composition theory. They aren't exactly rules, they are just observations that some compositional structures cause us to respond to an image in a more harmonic manner. Most strong images contain more than one compositional technique. In this way, one is sparking the attention of the viewer in different ways. Okay, I'm going to change over now and look at some individual photographs. The most commonly cited rule is the rule of thirds. And what that says is that if you split the image up into third lines, like this Cartier-Bresson image, the idea is to put the most important points of interest on the intersecting lines. This rule of thirds is actually a simplification of the golden rule, which is a mathematical formula called the golden spiral. And the golden spiral is part of every natural object. It creates a sense of harmony and helps to lead the viewer's eye around the image. It's possible to use this golden spiral in eight different ways. You can see how when I place the golden spiral over this photograph, it fits perfectly. But having said that, I really doubt that Henri Cartier-Bresson was consciously trying to fit his images to this kind of design. And I think when he was setting up to take this photograph, he knew exactly where he wanted to place the subject. Here are a few more of Cartier-Bresson's photographs, and you can see in his scenes how formally he's composing. This image by Marc Rabal perfectly fits the third rule. See how he's placed them exactly on the thirds. In Photography 101 textbooks, they'll probably say that it's far more interesting to have the main subject on the intersecting third lines. If you look at this image by Joseph Kadalka, his main subject is in the middle of the photograph, but he's used other tools to draw our attention to the central dog figure. He's used vanishing perspective to draw our eye into the center of the frame. He's also used high contrast to increase visual impact between the black dog and the white snow. The dog's movement immediately makes us aware of action and possibly danger. The strange shape that's been created by the Doberman-like ears is repeated throughout the photograph. 
The repetition that this produces is calming to the mind, which is very different to the feelings of danger that we receive when we look at the dog figure. Another photographer who uses the centrally placed image as a compositional tool is Robert Adams. And his reason for doing this is to almost accentuate the blandness and boringness of a scene. In these examples, he's also using a centrally placed horizon line, which accentuates this kind of almost dead space that he wants to communicate about. And he wants to show how unregulated urban sprawl have made landscapes ugly and, in a way, inhuman. So he's using the opposite of the harmonic golden spiral in order to emphasize a different feeling within one. Josef Kadelka is a perfect photographer to use when describing the rule of odds. What this rule says is that the human eye responds to a certain balance in groups or subjects in odd numbers rather than in even numbers. And generally the number three is considered the most powerful. These first three are fairly obvious. And here it's not just three subjects, it's three groupings of subjects. Even this photograph can be broken into three elements because behind this guy on the left you've got a white pillar. So that gives one. He's isolated. And this white pillar and the white wall separate these two people into one element. Dorothy Lang's migrant mother is an example of rule of odds. You've got three points of interest. It also fits the third rule. As well as providing an almost perfect graphic T. Another technique is the mirror effect. In this method, you're creating your composition by looking at a repetition. This technique is used a lot by wildlife photographers and landscape photographers. These are some really nice examples. What this does is produce almost perfect balance and therefore almost perfect symmetry. So if you draw a circle in this case, that's a really bad circle, but it's perfectly symmetrical. Sometimes perfect symmetry isn't what one should be looking for. It becomes more interesting when you shift the balance slightly. This is an example where Gary Winogrand has used the mirror effect. But what he's done is far more complex. The bottom of the photograph is filled with people lying on the grass, and the pattern of the people on the ground is mirrored by the balloons in the air. The repetition of the buildings that separates these two layers provides another pattern. This is another more complex example of using the mirror technique. This is a photograph by Matt Black of Magnum. You've got two diagonal lines going on here. But this young girl is almost the exact mirror of this young girl down here. Our minds have been programmed over millennia to look for this kind of repetition. This image by Matt Black is also playing on that brain circuit because he split the image into black and white. So he's formalized this photograph symmetrically and one's mind is expecting a yin-yang type feel. But within this very formal structure, he's created this person looking that way, him looking out and towards us, and this strange stop and save sign in the back, which really disrupts the perfect symmetry of the photograph. These next two photographs by Matt Black have also used the mechanism of symmetry. So if one draws a line straight down the middle of the square image, then you've got a cross that's been perfectly set up. 
and even though the background detail is different on either side, you have an image that the mind can grasp as a symmetrical image. In this case, it is the symmetry that allows us to read this photograph, even though the subject matter has a horror to it. The horns, the eyes, and the central rope fix the symmetry. He's managed to disturb the viewers by providing the comfort of symmetry, but then disturbing us by the actual content and the horrific expression on its face. This photograph was taken by Paul Strand in 1916, and I've always found it a bit disturbing and unnerving, even though it's quite simplistic. There's something really dark emotionally about this photograph. If it was taken in the 60s, I would have said it's a rebellion against the constrictions of suburbia. But I'm not sure. It almost has a feeling of the horrors that can happen behind the picket fence in suburban environments. The wooden slats provide a rhythm, a pattern, or repetition. But the emotional depth comes from what you see behind it, as well as the murky contrast which holds this unease. Repetition is a really strong compositional tool, but in order to elevate the image above just a pattern, you have to look for something that breaks the monotony. This is actually a manipulated image of doves, but it's a perfect example to illustrate repetition in a way that isn't too uniform and therefore boring. In the late 1800s, Edward Maybridge produced these images that exploit repetition and were the precursor to film and television. Just a little footnote to end off, this photographer at some stage shot someone who was having an affair with his wife, but eventually he was acquitted of murder. Thanks for watching this video. If you found it useful, please look out for the next two episodes on composition. See you next time. Is it over yet? This is good. It really is. What are they? Well. and find out what the future holds in store. Is it over yet?